Next item of business is debate on motion 16408 in the name of Colin Smith on free bus travel for under 25s. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons down. I call on Colin Smith to speak to and move the motion. Mr Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. The starting point for Labour in this debate is the basic principle that public transport is a public service. And like all public services, it should be accessible to all. Now, that might seem obvious, but under the fragmented, deregulated, privatised bus network we have today, public transport has become detached from public service. Instead of our buses being an essential service, they've become just another commodity for private companies to make a profit. We have devalued the critical role our bus network plays for our economy, for our communities and for our environment. Across Scotland, there are 388 million bus journeys a year as people use our buses to access work and education, to socialise, to attend medical appointments. For those people, buses are a real lifeline. But although bus travel remains the single most popular form of public transport, accounting for three quarters of all journeys, that number has been in decline. Since this government came to power, the number of bus journeys has fallen by 20% alone, while bus fares have risen by 17% in real terms. Give I'll give way, yeah. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Would you accept that bus usage has been in decline since before 1960, so it is not just linked to the SNP? Colin Smith. But bus usage has certainly been in decline for a long time, but it's continued to be in decline under deregulation, and it's significantly in decline under this government, with no plan in place to halt that decline whatsoever. And there are many reasons for that decline. Change in shopping habits, different work patterns, growing congestion. But decisions made by this government have contributed to that decline. The bus services operator grant has been reduced by 28% under the SNP. There has been an overall 11 per cent fall in support for buses over the past five years alone. And the eye-watering cuts to council budgets again this year inevitably are leading to yet more cuts in bus routes across Scotland. There has also been a failure to make the necessary structural changes, with the government opposing not one but two Labour members' proposals to re-regulate our buses. In short, we have had a decade of decline in our buses under this government and little meaningful action to halt it. And it is those who can least afford it who are being disproportionately affected. Young people, older people, the unemployed, students and others on low income. They are the most likely to use our buses, so are hit hardest by fare hikes and the action of services, removing for many of our most vulnerable citizens their only viable travel option. That is especially the case in rural communities such as the one that I represent. Now, with fares rising and routes falling, it is little wonder so many people feel unable to depend on public transport as their main mode of travel, with car usage continuing to grow. President officer, that is not sustainable. Transport accounts for more than a third of all greenhouse gas emissions, with cars contributing 40 per cent of this. In 2016, greenhouse gas emissions from Scotland's transport sector were at the same level they were in 1990. The air pollution this causes is costing lives, two and a half thousand lives a year in Scotland. We need to reduce the vehicles on our road and better buses is the key to achieving this. But that will require a bold rethink about how we manage our bus network in Scotland. The timid transport bill before Parliament at the moment fails to achieve this. President officer, we have to wake up to the fact that the current unregulated market is simply not working. We need to properly protect the lifeline services currently being axed and stop bus companies simply cherry picking the most profitable routes. Now, that means fully lifting the ban on local councils, setting up and running local buses to meet their community's needs. It's no coincidence that Lothian Buses, Scotland's only municipal bus company, has seen their pa passenger numbers grow while patronage elsewhere plummets, or that they have a 95 per cent customer satisfaction rating with some of the lowest fares in Scotland. This is the result of a model which prioritises the passenger over profits, a model which encourages social responsibility and, crucially, delivers millions of pounds a year back into the public purse. In 2017, Lothian buses made almost £7 million of profits, and this money, which elsewhere in Scotland would be siphoned off to shareholders, was instead reinvested in services. Every local authority in Scotland should have the power to develop such a model for their community. And if the government do not amend the Transport Bill to deliver that, then Labour will. I uh, will take one quick intervention if I have got time back. Yes. You have time. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Councillor, for taking intervention. Uh, I heard what you just said regarding loading buses, but we accept that not every local authority area would actually have that capability. 
uh, to have uh, the similar model to loading buses because of population. Colin Smith. And there's absolutely no reason whatsoever, as happens in Lothian, why local authorities can't come together to produce bus services that cut across an arm's length body. That's the Lothian model, but the problem is this government stopped the rest of Scotland following that model. Reintroducing municipal ownership is an essential first step in rebuilding our bus services. But the scale of the challenge calls for an even bolder action and proper investment in our bus services. One of the biggest success stories of this parliament in its 20-year experience has been, existence has been the free bus pass for older adults and disabled people introduced by Labour in 2006. Free bus travel for the over 60s has helped tackle isolation, create opportunity and fight pensioner poverty. It's widely used and highly valued by those who use it. A poll conducted by Age Scotland found that 96% of respondents believe the bus pass was essential or very important to their well-being. Not only does it provide social and personal benefits, it's highly cost-effective, with every one pound spent on the scheme generating almost three pounds in broader social and economic benefits. That's why Labour supports the bus pass being expanded to companions of disabled children under five and modern apprenticeships as already proposed. But we want to go further. We want to open up opportunities for Scotland's young people. And that's why we're asking Parliament today to agree the principle that free bus travel should be extended to young people. Transport costs are a huge burden on young people and their families. With many, I'll take a quick Oh, I'm afraid uh, you can't. Okay, I'm sorry, fine, no he's going into his last minute. Okay, thanks very much. Many, earnings below, many young people earning below the adult minimum wage, never mind the living wage, young people can find themselves spending half their income on travel alone. The cost of travel has become a barrier to opportunity, and Parliament has a chance today to break down that barrier. The ability to pay should not determine young people's access to education, to jobs, and to social and leisure activities, but the reality is it does. Free bus travel will help put a stop to this injustice. It will provide young people with the same benefits it delivers for older adults and disabled people. But beyond that, it will tackle the wider decline of our bus usage in Scotland by encouraging lifelong habits where the next generation choose public transport as their primary mode of transport. President officer, this policy is a win-win. It gives young people a break and invest in their future. And it will help halt the dismantling of Scotland's bus routes before our network disappears for good in more of our communities. I therefore move the motion in my name and ask members to send a clear message to Scotland's young people. This parliament is on your side. Thank you very much. I now call Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and move Amendment 16408.3. Five uh, minutes, please. Senator Officer, I move the amendment in my name. I, I welcome the debate on bus, which accounts for some three quarters of all public transport journeys in Scotland. Buses serve the whole of Scotland, including the most vulnerable, with today's debate focusing on our young people. I want to outline what we are doing to support and improve bus services before signalling our intent to conduct further work in this area. Just last week, bus passenger satisfaction figures were strong again, with 91% of passengers satisfied with their bus service in Scotland, compared to just 88% in England. However, bus passenger numbers continue to decline right across the UK, as they have since 1960. The causes are varied, and we are working with partners to address that where we can. Amongst the host of measures this government is taking forward uh, to improve transport is the Transport Bill. Outlines a range of options for local transport authorities to adopt in improving bus services by statutory partnership, franchising, or even running services themselves in certain circumstances. I am happy to give way to uh, Stuart Stevenson. Mr Stevenson. Uh, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that between 2007 and 2017, the drop in uh, bus services in Wales was the biggest of all those of the nations of the United Kingdom? And, of course, it is a Labour administration in Wales. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I am aware of that. However, as I'm sure all members in the Chamber will recognise, is that bus patronage has been in decline for decades now. And the reasons for that are complex. And the suggestion that there is one simple solution in order to address that is misguided. I'll, I'll give way briefly to the member. I wonder if the minister can also confirm that passenger numbers actually rose from 460 million a year in 2004 to 487 million in 2007 when Labour left office. And I think actually the concessionary 
uh, travel scheme that was introduced by the Labour, last Labour government. Uh, uh, interventions have to be short. Cabinet Secretary, I can't. Cabinet Secretary, a moment. Senator, I can't give you time back because we have no spare time now. Cabinet Secretary. Senator, Officer, I do welcome, I, I do recognise the point which the member uh, is making, but I also welcome the Rural Economy and Connectivities Committee's support for the general principles of the Stage 1 report on the Transport Bill. Alongside the legislative measures, uh, this government continues to provide over £250 million of support for bus services and concession travel as part of our £1 billion of annual public transport funding. The Bus Service Operators Grant, which supports bus services across Scotland, has provided some £682 million of investment in supporting 5.2 billion passenger journeys since 2006-2007. Last year, we made the decision to retain the age of eligibility for older people at 60. Uh, we also listened to views from other issues uh, and committed to extending the scheme to co cover companion cards for eligible disabled children under five. And we're working towards the pledge to extend concessionary travel for modern apprentices. In addition to that, we are, what we're doing with free bus travel, we have the Young Scott National Concessionary Travel Scheme for all young people aged 16 to 18 and full-time volunteers up to the age of 25. It provides a third off bus and rail travel and 50% off rail season tickets in Scotland with eligible cardholders who live in Scottish Islands receiving ferry vouchers for two free return journeys to the mainland. And from January 2007 to 2017-18, the scheme has provided some £16 million worth of concessionary travel discounts, contributing to some 27 million journeys. The importance of improving young people's experience of public transport was recently highlighted in the Scottish Youth Parliament's All Aboard report, a challenge that all partners in transport need to rise to. Of key relevance to today's debate is they are asked to review the existing young people's concessionary discount on public transport to include all young people under 26. At the third annual meeting of Cabinet members with children and young people earlier this month, we discussed this very issue and agreed to take forward such a review. In addition, we'll be conducting an appraisal which considers the costs and benefits of extending free bus travel to young people under the age of 26. That said, it's important that we take this forward, recognising it needs to be financially sustainable. But an officer, it's been suggested such a scheme might cost in the region of £13.5 million. The reality is it's more likely to cost on an annual basis between £200 and £230 million a year. As a government design officer, we will continue to take forward a range of measures in order to improve transport for the public in Scotland, and the Transport Bill helps us support in achieving that to support bus services at a local level. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to speak to move amendment 18, I beg your pardon, 1648.2. Mr Green, please, four minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start Labour by bringing forward this subject? Uh, there is actually much to agree with them on. Uh, in the main body of their motion. The bus industry is no doubt facing several, but also very complex challenges at the moment. Journey numbers, as we know, have fallen by uh, over uh, 100 million over the last uh, decade, but equally fair revenue continues to fall as a percentage of total operator revenue, despite the fact that fares have increased in price. Passenger satisfaction is an ongoing concern. In a recent survey I looked at this morning, 64% of passengers were dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the frequency of their local services, and 58% felt their local bus services were poor value for money. Now, there is no disagreement from these benches at all that concessionary funded bus travel has several and very welcome social and economic benefits for those who use the service. But submissions to us from uh, the likes of CPT, Transform Scotland, uh, the Poverty Alliance, and Friends of the Earth, I think deserve some merit. I read them in advance of today's debate. They point to factors such as the cost of, the effectiveness of, the reliability of, but also the stigma around bus usage as key barriers to access and improving passenger uptake. So this is a welcome debate. It kicks off a sensible debate about eligibility, but I think we should have a frank and honest debate about this. Who is eligible, why they're eligible, and how we will fund any additional free travel. And that gets to the crux of our amendment today. Now, we chose to agree with most of what Labour are actually saying, but committing to a new user group without a wider discussion about the cost effectiveness of the overall scheme, whilst socially admirable, is not sensible policy making. 
Any changes to concessionary eligibility must be undertaken with consultation uh, with groups who represent current or potential users, uh, but also with the bus industry itself. There are over 200 operators in Scotland and we must consult with them before making such sweeping changes. Now, we don't oppose changes to the scheme. Indeed, we have, in other manifestos, had our own ideas about extension of the scheme to some areas such as community transport. But there must be due and proper analysis given to the long-term cost and feasibility of these extensions or changes. Now, unfortunately, due to uh, procedural preemptions, uh, we're unable to support the Scottish Government's amendment. However, for the record, I would like to add that there's nothing to disagree with it. If you compare the two amendments before us today, I think our choice of words better reflects how we as a Parliament ought to proceed with the subject. But I do apologise to the Scottish Youth Parliament in that regard because I hold the work they did in the subject in high regard. I welcome their calls for review. But the overarching message I want to get across in the short time I have today is that it seems to me inexplicable how we can commit to adding further users to the eligibility criteria when the current concessionary travel scheme is already running out of money 10 months into the financial year. Reaching the £200 million cap in this year's annual subsidy settlement to bus operators before the end of the financial year means that operators are already looking to potentially cut services, cut routes, change timetables, or increase fares. That's under the current scheme, and that's be add, before we add a single free journey to a single new passenger. If the current model is not working, why would we choose to add to that burden without a clear pathway of how government will adequately compensate operators for that service? A headline-grabbing conference speech from Labour announcing universal free travel is no doubt an easy and popular thing to do. But easy and popular are not choices that governments face yeah. often. I do not think it really addresses the serious underlying issues that the industry faces, something the Confederation of Passenger Transport agrees with. We do need to have a sense of debate about how to make best use of public funds to improve bus patronage. I welcome it. Labour have suggested one road to take. I respectively suggest we look at all avenues. Uh, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, and thank you for speaking to time. John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumble. It's a tight four minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, my concessionary bus pass declared. Um, the, Scottish gained, uh, the Scottish Government has a transport budget of £1.155.6 billion, um, and uh, a larger sum for capital. And over the last seven years, that budget's increased by about 20%. Uh, bus services, in contrast, have only increased by about 5%, and the bulk of that has been on concessionary fares. Now, I would align myself with many of the comments made by my, my colleague uh, Colin Smith there, certainly about uh, the market and how that's distorted things, and at decision time we will be supporting the, the Labour Party um, motion. Um, and that's investments rather than direct investment in services, and, and Colin Smith again talked about the Lothian model. And what's not like to like about something that delivers such high levels of satisfaction, works collaboratively across local authorities, delivers profit and a good service. And uh, that's the model that we would like to see replicated. Um, unfortunately, of course, in the scheme of things, it's, it's quite an anomalous model, I accept that. But the municipal model and indeed scope for inclusion of community transport is very important. The Scottish Green Party advocate uh, fair free access to public transport, and that includes ferries. And it is all about relative priorities because the minister, uh, the, I beg your pardon, the cabinet secretary came up with a figure there of um, 200 to 230 million. Well, if, if that's the correct figure, then that's roughly double, double what the existing uh, um, concessionary uh, sum is of 230 million, which we agreed um, in the REC committee just the other week. Um, but of course, everything's about priorities. And I don't hear the level of consultation about the investment, this blind obsession with road building that the Scottish Government have, supported by the other parties. So politics is always about uh, priorities. And if the priorities isn't serving the public in the widest sense, then what is it? Because of course, there's a group of people who uh, use buses, and uh, predominantly buses are used by people earning 15, 10 to 15,000 pounds a year. 58% of bus users are women. And of course, we know that 30% of households in Scotland do not have access to a motor vehicle. So we must prioritise this. The road haulage lobby, the motor car lobby has had its say uh, for, for too long. But of course, yes, indeed. Liam Kerr. Very clear. So the member is proposing that uh, the government take money from the roads budget and plough it into uh, this system. Is that correct? John Finney. 
Well, that's not correct. It would require much more comprehensive discussion than that. But, of course, there isn't the same level of debate about road building. And, of course, there's the difference between capital and revenue and the revenue costs of maintaining the, the capital build. But, you know, I don't see why this small sum in the scheme of things requires this, uh, this, le this uh, level of almost, why would you do that? We know the benefits, and the, 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 the government know the benefits themselves, because when we were considering the statutory instrument about the, the, the concessionary payer, uh, the, one of the supporting papers said, and I quote, in response to surveys, cardholders tell us that schemes provide them with social and health benefits, including by enabling them more easily to access service services. Now, the Green Amendment wasn't accepted, and it was a further extension of this to include those um, with addiction issues in, in receipt of treatment, because we know that a lot of these people have chaotic lifestyles, and one thing that would help them would be the stability of at least not having to worry about their transport, uh, transport needs. Um, also, we, we've debated buses a lot. March of last year, I led a Green debate where we were trying to seek a, a statutory target being placed on the Scottish Government about uh, passenger numbers, because they have been in, in decline. We need to deliver cheaper fares, more re routes and reliable services, because we know that these are the things that deliver success and increased bus use, as we've seen in Edinburgh. Now, in the short time, I'm going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. Call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Neil Bibby. Well, it is indeed very helpful to have this very short debate today on the importance of bus travel, and we shall ret return to the issue soon as we debate the Stage 1 report on the Government's Transport Bill two weeks from now, when we shall have more time to explore the issue in greater detail. There is agreement that we must take action to arrest the further decline in bus use which has taken place over the last few years, and stopping this decline in bus usage would help meet a range of environmental, health and social inclusion objectives. I think we're all agreed about that. So how do we address the decline? Well, the Scottish Government has come up with some ideas, but in our view, they fall somewhat short of what is required. One of the ways to address the decline is for the Scottish Government to subsidise bus usage more widely, and I'm pleased that the present Government has continued the policy of free bus passes for the over 60s and disabled, first introduced by my Liberal Democrat colleague, <clears throat> Tavish Scott, when he was Transport Minister in Scotland's coalition administration. And I'm amazed that the Labour Party forget who was the transport minister at the time. This policy is not a cheap option though. Running at some 213 million pounds for the Scottish taxpayer in the forthcoming year. However, it is generally accepted as being a great success in that it not only helps the individuals themselves, but society at large by reducing congestion and helping the environment. And coincidentally, I trust, that at decision time, we will approve the bus concessionary scheme for old and disabled people for the coming year in Graham Day's name at decision time. Now, this is where I now turn to the detail of the motion and the amendments before us today. I was expecting the Labour Party to bring forward a motion to promote its new policy of having free buses for the whole population. So I was somewhat surprised to read the motion before us and find that it wasn't there. I fully expected to find a fully costed proposal from the Labour Party for the new policy. And I can't tell you how disappointed I was not to find that there either. So the motion before us concentrates solely on extending the present scheme to those who are under 25 years of age. However, what is also disappointing, a lot of disappointment today, is to see that while the proposal is here to extend free bus travel to the under 25s, there's no mention of how much taxpayers' money this would cost and how it is proposed to pay for it. Now, far be it from me to suggest that this is a somewhat cavalier approach to budgeting. If I've got time to get back, presenting officer, no, I can't, I'm afraid. As I say, apart from, it's a, it's a cavalier approach to budgeting from the Labour Party, I have to say, but I'm sure the finance minister from the government uh, mightn't be slow to take this view. It's for the, this reason that the Liberal Democrats will be supporting the Scottish Government amendment today, which takes a more reasonable approach to this issue of extending the free bus passes to others. We certainly believe that before we commit the Scottish Government to extend the free bus pass scheme, a cost-benefit analysis must be undertaken. This would only be the prudent thing to do. I can see the leader of the Labour Party blushing, but there we are. It would have been a far more reasonable motion to debate if the Labour Party had taken the trouble, if they'd taken the trouble 
to identify exactly how much taxpayers' money would be needed to fund this extension of the scheme. The fact that this commitment is completely unfunded means that the Labour Party can't reasonably, I mean, they, come on, they can't really reasonably have expected support for it. Presiding officer, it's for that reason that we support the government's amendment to the motion before us today. Thank you. I call Neil Bivy to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. The bus market in Scotland is broken. The deregulated model introduced over 30 years ago has failed. It's failed passengers, failed the public, and failed on its own terms. Instead of a competitive market, there is a patchwork of monopolies serving a diminishing network. As Colin Smith said, having, despite having the power to replace the broken market with a fairer, more robust system, the Scottish Government have presided over a decade of decline in bus services. Passenger numbers plummeting, the total number of bus journeys down by 100 million, 64 million vehicle kilometres stripped out of the bus network. Fleet sizes are down, industry staff numbers are down, routes cut. Meanwhile, fares keep rising and rising. In my own region, passengers are being asked to pay more each year, despite facing further disruption and service cuts. Bus companies in West Scotland have made sweeping timetable changes, cut lifeline routes and scrapped services altogether. Presiding officer, enough is enough. It's time for new thinking, new ideas about how bus services should be run, owned and controlled, and how to achieve a modal shift in society towards cleaner, greener public transport. That's why I welcome this debate today and the wider debate about free bus travel initiated by Richard Leonard. And I hope that Parliament will agree to support in principle the idea that concessionary travel should be extended to those under the age of 25. President officer, as I said earlier, when Labour left office in Scotland before the SNP's decade of decline, passenger numbers were actually rising. Why was that? Because we just introduced the free bus pass with the support of the Liberal Democrats. I acknowledge that. And I don't see why, Mike, we can't work together to deliver this policy as well. The free bus pass has come to represent not just a lifeline for many of our older and disabled people, but a substantial investment in public transport too. Extending concessionary travel to the under 25s would open up new opportunities and possibilities for our young people. Opportunities for young people on low wages to get to work, to get from A to B, and to study without having to pay exorbitant bus fares. That's surely not too much for our young people to ask. But we want to go further. It's not just about uh, having a bus pass. You need to know there's an actual service to use that bus pass on. And we want to make bus travel more affordable for all. The decline of bus services needs not to be inevitable. It can be reversed. If the bus companies cannot or will not deliver services that meet the needs of the community, then it's time to give our communities the power to deliver bus services themselves. A people's bus service, a service run for passengers, not profit. That's what Scottish Labour, the Cooperative Party, trade unions and passengers all want to make a reality. The Scottish Government's transport bill should be amended to provide a realistic route to common ownership of bus services. It should make municipal ownership of buses like we see in the Lothians possible elsewhere in Scotland and allow councils to work with community-owned operators too. And crucially, it should call time on the deregulated market, shifting power from the owners of the big bus companies to the communities in my region that depend on public transport. Faced with a broken market and a diminishing bus network, there can be no doubt that something has to change. My Labour colleagues and I will continue to argue for democratic control of bus services, and I hope when the time comes there will be a majority in this Parliament for strengthening the Transport Bill. Today I hope the Parliament will agree that as part of a transformative agenda for public transport that bus travel should be free for the under 25s. And on that basis, I hope Parliament will support the Labour motion in the name of Colin Smith today. Thank you. Thank you. And I call John Mason to be followed by Edward Mountain. Hey, thank you very much. So we come today to a Labour debate which asks for more spending, but has no mention in the motion of where the money is to come from. Yeah. So what's new? However, let us look first at the transport side of this debate. Is targeting young people under 25 the most, are they the most in need of help? Is the fall in bus patronage primarily linked to fares? Well, it does seem there are other reasons for fall in bus use. For example, some young people who can afford it are certainly using taxis and private hire, apparently because they feel safer or it's more convenient. Improved train services are another issue in my own uh, Carmyle area of my constituency. 
the train service has greatly improved and there's been a subsequent decline in the level of bus services. I do appreciate the briefing we've had from a number of organisations for today's debate, including from the Confederation of Passenger Transport, who point out that falling bus patronage is caused by worsening congestion, low cost of car ownership, changing work patterns and a rise of online shopping. Transform Scotland highlight the KPMG report, which gives three main reasons for the fall. First, car ownership, second, online services, and third, bus journey time. Now, having a car is obviously expensive, and it seems surprising that anyone should argue it's cheap. But I think the problem there is that the one-off cost of purchase, and I'm thinking of replacing my car, and that might cost me, say, £12,000, then you've got the annual costs of insurance, you've got road tax, you've got services, you've got MOT. But the problem is that the marginal or the extra cost, if you've got a car already, of taking a family out for a day is actually pretty low. And it's, probably, it's definitely lower than the train and it's probably lower than the bus. So one challenge I think we have is how to increase or should we increase the marginal cost of car use and certainly parking costs, either at work or elsewhere, is a factor that comes into play in that regard. Transform Scotland also make the point that public ownership is no guarantee of increased bus usage. Bus patronage has been declining since at least 1960. Poverty Alliance and Oxfam a, put affordability at the top of their list when holding an event in February on transport and poverty. That makes me wonder if age is the best measure of need. It is true that we use age as the measure for the over 60s, which means relatively well-off people like myself do not need to pay for the bus, and it's up to us if we give the savings away. Uh, Mr Finney, yes. John Finney. Uh, thank you, Mr Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention, but would the member be aware that the turnaround in services in East, Loth East Lothian that Lothian buses did was specifically because they targeted young people and have had a positive return on that? John Mason. I mean, I suppose I would suggest that anyone we target and anyone we give a, a free bus pass to is more likely to use them. And that's where, you know, there's some argument that families with children are actually the most hardest hit uh, by bus fares and train fares rather than young people. Uh, on the positive side, I do agree that more people uh, using buses is a good thing, even if, it is, if they're subsidised and that protects services. And I would disagree slightly with the Confederation of Tr Passenger Transport, who say that the concession scheme is not a subsidy, but just a payment for a service. Moving on to the financial side, is this proposal costed? Why was it not in the Labour budget negotiations? The Confederation of Passenger Transport suggests that it will cost £200 million, pounds, eh, roughly matching eh, the present, because there would be roughly the same number of people involved, whereas I believe Richard Leonard has suggested £13 million. Pounds. So I th in conclusion, I think it is worth exploring uh, a possible expansion to free bus travel, uh, but it has to be based on a proper appraisal, and for once I do agree with Jamie Green, uh, considering both the costs and the benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have to say I think that Labour Party's policy, uh, motion today shows a bit of a lack of ambition and looks a bit like an uncosted political opportunism, opportunism to me. I believe if you're going to have a vision, the vision should be about our future, not about a political future. And I don't believe it's the day for Parliament to be rushed into making uncosted decisions on extending concessionary bus travel. We should be really looking at the real problem, which to me is all about the declining use of buses. If we address this, what we want to achieve with less cars on the road, less congested streets and a reduction of emissions will naturally follow. And that, to me, is the responsible thing to do. The problem of failing bus usage does not boil down to the price of a ticket. We heard that in the Royal Economy and Connectivity Committee. It's far more complicated than that. We've heard numerous sessions in the committee when we looked at the transport bill, and we heard that the culture has changed. People now expect smart ticketing. They expect up-to-date and up-to-the-minute travel information. And they expect to get to A to B on time with less delays and without changes. For too long, timetabling issues and gaps in the services have meant that passengers are heavily inconvenienced and the result is they question whether they should be travelling on the bus at all. And it's no wonder 
that the latest surveys indicate that passengers do not regard travelling on the bus as good value for money. In the Highlands, for example, we've heard that satisfaction levels with the value of money have fallen from 59% to 51%. That, to me, is a damning statistic. In recent years, it's also become clear that there's been a huge shift away from travelling on the bus, with the number of journeys falling by 100 million in the past decade. That big statistic tells us one thing. The way Scotland chooses to travel is changing. And if we want to more people to take the bus, we need to come up with solutions that encourage the whole population to do so. We need a holistic approach that gets the young, the old, and everyone in between back on the bus. We also need to ensure that our bus operators deliver services across all the routes that we want them to. If I've got time. Yes, I do have time. Mr Finney. John Finney. Thank you, Mr Senator. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would the member uh, acknowledge that the profile of bus user in Edinburgh is different from elsewhere, mm. and of course that is a publicly run and owned yeah. service. Edward Mountain. I absolutely understand that the profile of, of travel in Edinburgh is different. But the problem is, is Edinburgh has a system and a bus patronage, sorry, a bus operation system that dates back a long time, which means that we can't roll that out across all of Scotland. So I believe that there's a problem across rural Scotland because we see that bus services are being scrapped and that we're seeing lifeline services that we need being discontinued with huge damaging consequences. And this is the matter that we want to be addressing. Because as my constituents know only too well, once a bus route is removed, rural communities become more isolated and opportunities are closed off to them. And if there's no bus service, there's no gain from having a concessionary bus uh, pass. Presiding officer, let me be clear. I want to see high quality services delivered by well-managed bus operators and I want to see more buses being used by more people across Scotland. I don't believe extending concessions without knowing what the costs are is the right approach. What we can say for certain that extending concessionary bus travel to under 25s would reverse the decline of bus travel? No, I don't think it would. The decline in bus travel is far more complex to that. So let's treat it like that. It's time to consult passengers, in my opinion, and to talk to operators and improve services for buses and the, uh, the people that use them across Scotland. That's what we should be discussing, not concessionary travel. Thank you. I call Jenny Mara to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Presiding officer, I was delighted with Scottish Labour's visionary policy proposal at our conference in Dundee for a public universal free service. This proposal comes at a time when bus journeys have fallen, fares have gone up, but critically, it comes at a time when we are starting to realise in stark terms the impact of travel on the planet. Last week, Richard Leonard, our leader, joined young people protesting about climate change. And this policy is in direct response to that monumental challenge and to the needs of our communities. In Dundee, I'm sorry, I don't have time. In Dundee, we have one of the lowest rates of car ownership, but we don't have strong enough public transport arrangements to meet people's needs. Bus rates and frequency of services are still decided on a profit motive. Councillors in Dundee regularly campaign to keep services and bus routes to their communities. I believe that a more modern, forward-thinking country does not decide bus routes and services on the basis of profit, and that is why Scottish Labour is offering a modern transport policy for a modern country. Presiding officer, let me raise the issue of polluting buses that I have raised in this chamber many times before. Now, since I started raising this issue, we have seen some progress in Dundee. We have just had the launch of 14 new hybrid buses, the first hybrid buses for the city, cleaner of Euro 6 standards that have replaced older polluting vehicles but we still have over 100 buses on our streets that do not meet the emissions standards. We have 57 buses that are dirty Euro 3s belting out filth into the lungs of our citizens. On top of that, we have 47 Euro 5s that don't meet the European standards either. 
These 104 buses will either have to be off our roads by next year or retrofitted with urgency. Why is that? Because, of course, by 2020, next year, we are moving to the low emission zones in four cities across the country, including Dundee. I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary today, will there be enough money coming to all the cities but specifically to Dundee, for new or upgraded buses to replace these 104 vehicles. Because my concern, Cabinet Secretary, is that routes and services may have to be cut to meet the low emission zones. Dundee cannot afford for any bus routes or services to be cut. So I am looking for that assurance today. Is there going to be enough money in this budget to make sure that our buses meet the emission standards that allows us to move to the low emission zone next year? Thank you. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me first of all draw uh, members' attention to my being the honorary president of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, and indeed it's the AGM of the SAPT uh, a week on Friday in Perth. If any colleagues wish to join me, Tom Harris will be an excellent speaker, albeit he's speaking on trains, not, uh, uh, not on buses. Um, I will say right at the outset, and I've said it before, but I don't criticise everything that Labour, and indeed the Liberal Democrats, did in their period in office in 1999 to 2007. The work that Jack McConnell led on smoking was visionary, successful, and to be applauded, and I will do so again. And equally, as another uh, bus uh, pass holder, um, which I've just looked up on my mobile phone, and in the electronics of it, it says it never expires. And that's certainly true under this government, uh, despite uh, some of the uh, myths that were peddled at various points, is another great achievement of the period from 1999 to 2007. I'm a user of it, as well as a holder, but I'm in that 46% of people who use it at least once a month, rather than the weekly or daily. Uh, that's simply... Uh, due to my travel pass. Uh, so, I very much support the bus uh, pass scheme that we have. However, let's uh, look at what is proposed by the Labour Party. 19% uh, of our population uh, is 25 years or under. Uh, that is approximately a million, slightly over a million people. There are 1.3 million bus passes. Those bus passes currently cost us £200 million. So what is it going to cost uh, to provide bus passes to a slightly uh, similar number? Well, of course, if we're to believe uh, Richard Leonard when he was interviewed by Peter McMahon on representing borders, it will cost £13 million. Now, that's quite an interesting uh, uh, piece of arithmetic, how we're going to get the cost per uh, journey down to uh, something like... Uh, just over 10%, uh, I beg your pardon, it's not even 10%, it's just over 5% uh, of the current cost, I do not quite know. But that will be one that will run and run. So I think uh, working with the Scottish Youth Parliament, making sure that we understand the costs, is the basis upon which one can proceed. Now, I'm in favour of extending the bus uh, pass scheme. Uh, when I was Minister, I did in a relatively modest way for disabled uh, ex-servicemen. So in principle, I'm up for it. And I very much hope we find ways of doing it. I do say, however, to colleagues on my right, uh, quite gently, uh, that where the Labour Party are in power, rather than merely talking about being in power, uh, performance and behaviours are quite at odds with what I'm hearing from the benches uh, to my right. Um, we haven't seen, despite the power existing in Cardiff, uh, any move to uh, take public ownership of the buses. We haven't seen an extension of the concessionary schemes to anything other than local services, not a, a national scheme. We haven't seen in government anything that approximates uh, to bluntly what the Labour Party did before 2007 and much more uh, what they now seek us to do here. Let me just close by making an international comparison. My current intern, Bella, comes from California. Uh, she has a wee house on the other side of Edinburgh and travels in daily by bus. She is astonished and delighted with the quality of the bus service 
that gets it to Parliament every day. That accords with the 91% of people in the most recent survey who say our bus services are very good. That's the number that's going up, presiding officer. I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Richard Lyle. I thank you, presiding officer. I, I know the chamber may find it hard to believe, but I need to declare an interest as I am old enough to hold an over 60s bus pass. <laughs> Never know. Hard to believe, I know. I welcome the discussion that this motion has generated in the chamber today. It shines a light on the important issue that bus services and bus usage in Scotland are in long-term decline. And as a member of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, we discuss the use of public transportation frequently. And with climate change a major factor in future policy, it is important we encourage as many people as possible to use bus services. But a vital issue to me in these discussions is always the importance of buses to rural communities. They are a lifeline for some of our more remote areas, to towns and cities, shops and hospitals, work and school. Living in a city, it is easy and direct, direct access to these things can be taken for granted. Working here in, in Edinburgh I, during the week, I am amazed by the amount of buses and the routes that there are. It is fantastic to know that wherever you are in this city, a bus can take you to wherever you want to be. However, this is not the case in, for most of rural Scotland, and definitely not in the northeast region. Aberdeenshire Council in my region have to subsidise over half of the available routes, most of which are in rural areas. And budget pressures have led to 27 underutilised routes being cut the length and breadth of the region, with services in Lawrence Kirk, Peterhead and Braemar all affected. I will. Neil Finlay. After what he said there when he spoke very warmly about the Edinburgh service and the service in his own area, does he not know that he's just made the case for publicly owned bus services like we have in Edinburgh? Peter Chapman. Not at all. I don't accept that at all. That would make no difference. It still has to be paid for. Exactly. Um, we realise this may have a detrimental effect on passengers. With this, with Aberdeenshire Council's Head of Transportation has said, we realise this may have a detrimental effect on passengers, but the Council and communities will continue to have difficult decisions to make on the provision of local services into the future. And like all councils across Scotland, Aberdeenshire has had to grapple with budget de a budget deficit of over £20 million this year because of cuts from this SNP government. It is the same old story. Our constituents pay more and get less. And the North East deserves a fair deal. The REC Committee recently published our Stage 1 report on the upcoming Transport Bill, which included a number of recommendations as to how the Scottish Government can tackle the decline in bus patronage. The bill as it stands does not address this effectively, and the reduction of direct bus support in rural areas was a key argument raised. The ability to access transport can play a fundamental role in how a person can contribute to and participate in society and the lack of access to this transport can cause social isolation. At a time of budget cuts, getting a decent bus service in rural areas is more of a priority to me than giving free bus travel to everyone under 25. The reality is this, would only, this would only be an option to under 25s living in towns and cities. And it is vital that this is addressed going forward. In closing, presiding officer, it is obvious that more needs to be done to improve bus services and patronage, increase access in rural areas, and where financially possible, increase concessionary and subsidised travel. I support the amendment by my colleague Jamie Green, which recognises the merit in increased concessionary travel, but also recognises that comes at a cost. It equally recognises the concerning, concerning decrease in Scotland's bus fleet and patronage. That decrease needs to be addressed to help solve gridlock traffic and high levels of pollution in our towns and cities. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I call Richard Lyle before we move to closing speeches. Thank you, presiding officer. Firstly, can I declare that I also have a bus pass, but I don't look that age, do I? I want. I know. I don't believe it either. I want to begin my contribution this afternoon by stating clearly that I believe there is a great opportunity in respect of bus transportation 
um, and public transportation by bus. But we can be in no doubt that as a mode, this is a mode of transport which faces difficulties and requires solutions. Number of public transport journeys by bus has gone down, continues to do so. Yes, we must look to how we can reverse that trend. I believe, and so do my colleagues in the SNP, that we must continue to support bus travel and think of solutions to take us forward. But I say this, this cannot be done without the continual hindrance by both the Labour and Conservative parties. We want our public transport and the bus sector to be thriving. We can be ensure that it, it, that it will if both the Labour and Conservative parties would set aside their party political point scoring and focus on solutions. Like with all of the Labour Party proposals, one of the key questions remains unanswered. How are they going to fund this proposal? They have yet to come up with a legitimate solution. They may tell us an amount, but not where they'll get it. I think the term is doing their sums on the back of a bus ticket. If the Labour Party is now so keen in providing free bus travel for people under the age of 25, then I also ask why was this idea not presented when we in these benches were developing our budget plans. Some of us would have welcomed it. I believe that an appraisal should be taken forward as suggested by the cab sec. This, no, this has to be con conf uh, uh, conf confronted in an efficient and responsible manner. That's why this SNP government on public transport by bus spends up to £273 million pounds, and we've actually increased it uh, increased the spending by £18 million in the last two years. And the Labour Party, who don't even present a budget option, have the cheek to tell us we're doing nothing to solve this problem. Time Labour got on the bus and talked to us. This debate opens up questions and dialogue, though. How is public transport going to be costed? Who should be entitled to free bus travel? How is it going to be paid for? These are all questions that need to be addressed before we can move forward to ensure that we have the best answer possible to our problem. We should also start by encouraging the private sector to be more innovative. We can't propose to spend more money without indicating how we're going to fund the initiatives. So Labour, come and talk to us. I want to remind all our present today that the Tories are the ones who are responsible for deregulation of the public transport service. The Tories should be held responsible for their political mistake. In relation to uh, proposed amendments, I'd like to thank John Finney, who recognised in his amendment the extension of free bus travel for those currently recovering from substance addiction. And in fairness, uh, he's going to fall off his chair when I say this, I'd also like to recognise the amendment by Jamie Green. We need to be carefully review the financial implications that come with the motion. To irresponsibly propose to spend more money, it's an easy thing to do, but the people who make those claims are still not explaining how we're going to do it. How are we going to acquire the funds needed for the recommendation? Are they going to increase taxes? Are they going to reduce spending? When this government is faced with delivering more for the people of Scotland while continually facing continual austerity from the UK Tory government and its cuts agenda? I think we're on a consensual note, President Officer. I, of course, wish to recognise and say that we have to encourage people, in particular college, university students, young people, to use public transport by bus in the case of the 2019 budget. Likewise, I also agree with the amendment by Cabinet Sec. Public transport is the future. We have to find solutions together. I welcome the idea of Michael Matheson to review the extension of the discounts of public transport. With the responsible solutions, we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lyle. And we turn now to closing speeches. Liam Kerr to be followed by Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate and close for the Scottish Conservatives today because the fundamentals of the motion are, in our view, supportable. As many members have stated, bus patronage is reducing and that could lead to fewer routes, fewer employees, fewer assets and reduced investment in newer, cleaner technologies, which in turn reduces use still further. We can agree with the motion that there should be action to reverse this trend. But we have to be clear about what that action is and what the drivers are of the current decline. John Mason was uh, persuasive. The drivers of decline are much more than simply fares and include worsening congestion with increases in journey times, relatively low cost of car ownership, changing work patterns and a rise in online shopping. And if we start from that point, then we cannot support an unamended motion. Because whilst providing free bus travel for under 25s may have merit as a policy, 
And indeed, any extensions to concessionary travel could provide a number of social, financial, and employability benefits. As Jamie Green's amendment rightly craves, there is a fundamental lack of evidence as to the impact of such a policy on bus use, particularly if we start from the premise that it is not fares that drives a decline in use. As the Confederation of Passenger Transport succinctly put it, a further concessionary travel scheme would not address the underlying issues behind patronage decline, and in fact, could have the unintended consequence of contracting the bus network. And in any event, as Mike Rumble's made clear, it is not helpful to the debate and working towards a better future if proposals to add a whole new user group are introduced without first considering how much that scheme would cost. Now, no one in Labour was prepared to take my intervention to tell me how much they think this would cost. So I'm grateful to Stuart Stevenson for the reminder that Richard Leonard thinks it'll be 13 and a half million. Well, the Confederation of Passenger Transport projects that providing free travel to people under the age of 25 would cost around the same as the current concessionary travel scheme. And all in, that is creeping towards half a billion pounds a year. And in any event, let's say a cost can be isolated. Let's say a cost can be isolated. There has simply got to be more consideration about where that money comes from. Because presumably the cost of the policy won't be cannibalised from a health budget or an education budget. Although I see John Finney seems to suggest we reduced investment in the very roads the buses use. So it will need to be new money very quickly, Mr Finney. John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. Would the member acknowledge that this is a policy that would be part of a radical suite of changes, which would mean the whole budget would be re reconfigured anyway? And what figure would he think is acceptable to pay for this? I thank the member for the intervention. Look, everything needs to be paid for, Mr Finney, and the problem is you can't come to this chamber and propose policies like this without doing the groundwork that says how much it's going to cost. And so it will need to be new money altogether. And I know Richard Leonard said at his conference that he'd like to tax people more, uh, but what is he really going to do? Is he going to hypothecate any extra that comes from that tax and put it on bus travel instead of, say, funding the health service or funding the education service? Clearly not. Perhaps Labour would cut investment in bus services to cross-subsidise a concessionary scheme, but Transform Scotland pointed out it's already underfunded, and interestingly, Colin Smith said that every £1 spent on concessionary bus travel generates £3 in benefits, but a more recent research than the one he's using, I can share it later if he wishes, suggests investment in local bus infrastructure can deliver up to £8 in wider economic benefits per £1. So we cannot yet be certain this is the right way to go. And with such limited time, presiding officer, I'll conclude my remarks by saying simply that, yes, we're concerned about the reduction in passenger numbers. Yes, Scotland needs a competitive structure for bus services with affordable fares and a quality service. But proposals to extend concessionary travel should only be implemented in accordance with a long-term sustainable financial framework following adequate consultation with the users and the bus industry. And for this reason, we can only support the Labour motion at decision time if an amendment is accceded. Thank you. Thank you, I call Paul Pilaus to be followed by Colin Smith. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And this has uh, been a very important debate, of course, and I also want to recognise that it's been largely a consensual one. Uh, two consensuses, I suppose, one around the support for bus services across the Chamber, and perhaps another consensus around the failure of the motion as put to us to actually cost the proposal, uh, with the exception of the Labour Party, of course, who take a different view. I want to start out, Presiding Officer, by just um, uh, acknowledging uh, Mike Rumble's very sensible points, and indeed, uh, to be fair, the Conservatives' position around trying to ensure we have properly costed proposals before this, this Parliament. I uh, very much welcome uh, Mr Rumble's support and uh, recognise the, the, the point that he has made around the importance of getting the uh, fullest understanding of the costs and benefits of of any change of this nature uh, in the concessionary travel scheme before making that, and I think that's a very important point to have made. I think in terms of the uh, points I've made by other colleagues, I'll try and address them as I can, but I think the most important one to start with is the costing in information that we've discussed today already, and the Cabinet Secretary alluded to earlier. Uh, Labour haven't yet provided, uh, possibly they, they may do, a credible basis for the costings that uh, Mr Leonard has used uh, previously of £13.5 million. Pounds. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary set out earlier, the cost of extending fee bus travel to all 16 25 year olds in Scotland is estimated to be around £200 to £230 million per year, depending on the change in demand. And I would pose the question to Colin Smith and to Mr. Leonard um, what assumptions have they made about the reimbursement rate that they're assuming in that calculation? Yeah. And what assumption have they made about the uptake level? So, 
What are they, the, the modelling in that calculation, 13.5 million? Why is it? Why is it? Because both the Scottish you government. Both the Scottish Government and external stakeholders all think that 200 million is around the ballpark, 200 to 230 million, so they are way adrift in that estimate. Transport Scotland will conduct an appraisal as the Cabinet Secretary is committed to in his amendment, an amendment I support, uh, an appraisal which considers the costs and benefits of extending free bus travel to people under the age of 26. And to, to say to Mr Rumbles and indeed to Conservative members who have made this point, it will include consultation with stakeholders as well. So if the, as, as I hope, the Government amendment passes and the Conservative amendment then falls on a procedural basis, uh, members can have confidence that uh, consultation may be part of that review. Uh, in terms of the points being made by other members, Jenny Mara made uh, points, fair points around Dundee and the uh, use of hydrogen buses. Hydrogen buses that have, I would point out, been uh, partly funded by the Green Bus Fund, and we were obviously very supportive of that. But I would also like to highlight that um, in addressing her point about low emission zone, which she raises a fair point, there is £10 million identified in funding as we transition to that low emission zone in Dundee by 2022. £10 million for that, uh, that funding for that. £8 million of that is in the form of an abatement scheme to address uh, the retrofit of buses to try and improve the emission standards to Euro 6 which hopefully will help uh, the point that Ms uh, Mara has raised in her, in her uh, points today. In relation to uh, the points made by other members, uh, John Finney has raised a, a very legitimate point about protection of vulnerable groups who have chaotic lifestyles. I recognise the point he's made. Um, the work is ongoing across this government to look into these uh, sorts of issues in terms of how we work uh, to support uh, those who have vulnerability, uh, but obviously having to bear in mind the need to uh, achieve a balanced budget. But just recognising the point that his amendment, I appreciate, was not accepted today, but as other members have said, we very much sympathise with the needs of those individuals who are vulnerable indeed. In terms of other points that have been made, uh, Peter Chapman suggested that the, uh, there was a, a sense in the North East that they were not getting a fair deal. I would merely suggest, that, notwithstanding the issues about buses, the North East has had uh, AWPR open and is getting £300 million of investment in rail. So this government is very much supporting the communities in the North East in terms of transport investment. I do agree with Liam Kerr, with John Mason and others who have made the point that there are multifactorial reasons why there has been a decrease in bus patronage and we need to understand that before we make significant decisions uh, and spending commitments. While we very much support the work that is being undertaken by the Scottish Youth Parliament presiding officer uh, and I would also add that the transport bill um, on the aspects of transport bill and bus services are very much uh, addressing uh, longer strategic issues around the provision of bus services. So I don't think it's true for Colin Smith to say there's no plan at all to address the decrease in, in bus patronage. That's quite wrong, in my opinion. It offers a new, ambitious model for bus services. It provides local authorities with options to influence and improve bus services in the area. And the Cabinet Secretary has indicated he's open to widening the provisions within the bill on that point. Uh, I'll better rest there, Presiding Officer, but thank you for your forbearance. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Colin Smith to wind up our debate. Thank you, President Officer. Bus travel is rarely debated in this Parliament. It receives a fraction of the support from government that a privatised rail oper operators receive, but it remains not only the most popular form of public transport, but one that those on the lowest incomes rely most heavily on, a point every single SNP, Tory and Lib Dem member ignored today. Scottish Government's most recent transport survey showed that more than half of those who travel by bus earn less than £20,000 a year. And the same publication showed that almost a fifth of those in the most deprived areas travel to work by bus compared to just 5% of those in the least deprived. Yet bus usage is on the decline. Stuart Stevenson was keen to ban around comparisons from other areas, but he failed to mention that passenger numbers in Scotland have fallen by nearly 8% in the past five years alone, but the fall across the rest of the UK has been 5%. And while, and while the cost of running a car is reduced in real terms, bus fares have risen by 17% over and above inflation. Fewer bus services and higher fares is a double whammy that hits the poorest hardest. It limits access to healthcare, to work, to education, to social networks, shops, sport, culture, the list and negative impact is endless. One the second, Mr Smith. Would members come in please keep the conversations down? Mr. Smith. The decline of bus services is compounding equality, yet the SNP, Tories and Lib Dem approach today is to accept that decline and that inequality as something that is inevitable. But, President Officer, it does not have to be that way if this Parliament takes the bold decisions it was established to take 20 years ago. 
Free bus travel for older people and the disabled was one of those bold decisions. It's improved access to services, promoted social inclusion, supported those on low incomes in particular, and improved health by promoting a shift away from the use of cars. If you remove the free bus pass from older people, you would remove more bus routes and passenger numbers would continue to plummet. But progress in extending the benefits of free bus travel to others is stalling under this government. In their budget, the government pledged to extend free bus travel to companions of disabled children under five this year, but they have now kicked that into the long grass along with plans to introduce a free bus pass for modern apprenticeships. And meanwhile, passenger numbers continue to fall. Getting on with free bus travel for modern apprenticeships and carers of disabled children and expanding it for young people will help tackle this decline. There's a robust framework in place through independent charity Young Scott, who already deliver for young people to take this policy forward. They currently work in collaboration and partnership with Transport Scotland and Councils, and most importantly, they are trusted by young people. Expanding that successful car to free bus travel would fully remove the affordability barriers facing young people and increase passenger numbers in the short term. And crucially, by encouraging the next generation to use buses as their main mode of transport at an early age, it will help achieve a long-term model shift. That's good for the environment, it's good for our health, and it's good for the fight against poverty. Because we know that young people are more likely to be in low-paid, insecure work, spending a disproportionate amount on travel. And low-income families, too, spend a significant amount of their income on their children's travel. President officer. Then offer free bus travel for young people will open up more opportunities for children and young people. It will help them better access education, employment and training at a pivotal point in their career, removing barriers to social and leisure activities and ensuring that transport poverty does not limit the potential of our young people. It's not a panacea by any means. It needs to go hand in hand with increased investment in infrastructure, improvements such as if I've got time I'll take the intervention. Jimmy Green. Thank you uh, to Colin Smith for intervention, but un under the logic of his proposal, can he explain to the Chamber, therefore, why a 24-year-old earning £25,000, £35,000 or £45,000 would get a free bus pass, but some someone earning, earning £15,000 at 25 years of age wouldn't? Where is the logic in the rationale behind the policy intention? Colin Smith. <laughs> I suspect there's probably not too many people fit into the category of, of, of Jamie Green's point there, but the reality is young people, young people are more likely to be in lower paid employment. They don't get even the, the minimum wage of an adult, never mind the living wage at the moment. You know? Now, as I said, it's not a panacea by any means. There are other measures that need to happen, such as lifting the archaic ban that stops local councils running their bus services so that we can have passengers, not profits, being put first on our buses. But extending free travel to young people would go a long way towards helping rebuild our crumbling bus network and embedding social justice in our transport system. Because public transport is fundamentally a public service, a principle that seems to have been lost in a privatised, deregulated system, a broken system, as Neil Bibby called it, and one which this government refuses to change. SNP, Tory and Lib Dem speakers have been quick to criticise Labour's plans, in between saying it's OK for them to have a bus pass, but not OK for young people to have a bus pass. But, and while, and while they were quick to criticise, not a single one of them, not a single one, put forward any vision of their own. There wasn't a single proposal from any of the party. They didn't explain how they will stop the decline in bus services. They didn't explain, they didn't explain how they would halt the rip-off fares. And they didn't explain to Scotland's young people why they should not have the same benefits older people receive through their fare free bus pass. President officer, in the absence of any vision whatsoever from any other parties, I urge them to back Labour's proposals today. Because SNP, Tory and Lib Dem members have a very clear choice to make. They can choose between a positive plan to give our young people a break and start rebuilding their bus network, or they can choose more decline on their buses. My motion makes it clear whose side Labour is on. We are on the side of Scotland's young people. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on free bus travel for under 25s. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 16433 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau uh, setting out a business programme. Could I ask Graeme Day to move the motion? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. 
No one has asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 16433 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motions 16434 and 16435 on the stage two timetables for two bills. Again, could I ask Graham Day to move the motions on behalf of the Moved, meeting? presiding officer. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak against the motions. The question is that motions 16434 and 16435 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motions 16436 and 16437 on approval of SSIs. Could I ask Graham Day to move these motions? Moved, President. Thank officer. you very much. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 16407.4 in the name of Richard Lockhead, which seeks to amend motion 16407 in the name of Ian Gray on student support, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16407.4 in the name of Richard Lockhead is yes, 94. There were no votes against. There were 29 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is the amendment 16407.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ian Gray be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16407.1 in the name of Liz Smith is yes, 29, no, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 16407 in the name of Ian Gray as amended on student support be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on a motion 16407 in the name of Ian Gray as amended is yes, 94, no, 29. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now, I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Michael Matheson is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Jamie Green will fall. The next question is that amendment 16408.3 in the name of Michael Matheson, which seeks to amend motion 16408 in the name of Colin Smith, on free bus travel for under 25s be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16408.3 in the name of Michael Patheson is yes, 65, 
No, 29. 29. There were 29 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in the name of Jamie Green therefore falls. And the next question is that motion 16408 in the name of Colin Smith as amended on free bus travel for under 25s be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 16436 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The next question is that motion 16437 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? And that concludes decision time. We'll move shortly to members' business in the name of Pauline McNeill on the prevalence of Crohn's and colitis in Scotland. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. <laughs>